our next speaker uh, uh, who works at Drop Stuff Media. And you can see one of their big projects over there, the big art ride. So they do this big interactive concept, usually shown on a, on a large screen. And there you can, with an Oculus Rift, have an experience where you can actually bike through European heritage. You need to try it out yourself. You can see it over there. Uh, our next speaker is Tim Meijerink. He's a um, uh, uh, head of education and Eindredactie. How do you say that again in English? Uh, editor. Yeah, editor-in-chief. Editor-in-chief at Dropstuff Media. And he will talk about, he's the project leader of this big art ride. So he'll talk about that and Dropstuff Media in general. Yeah. If you want to move over here, that, that feels, A, I can't, you know, make you deaf anymore. And it's a better, the better seats. <laughs> okay, the floor is all yours. Intimate. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> okay, hello guys. This is a very intimate, so it's nice. At least I can address everybody personally. Um, my name is Tim I'm from Drop Stuff, as you uh, already heard. Um, and part of what we do has to do with interaction design in the public space, gaming for a, l a large crowd. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the history of the projects that we did and how we got around to actually making those things happen, both on technology and on vision, like how do you get an idea and how do you make it work and how do you turn it into one of those trucks that moves around Europe. Um, so in order to do that, I'm going to take a little time lapse, go back to the beginning of where we started and then eventually we're going to end up in that truck. Um, we're situated in the uh, Sound of Vision building in Hilversum, uh, but we originally started with the four of us in Amsterdam. Uh, that was even before I was around because that was originally the graduation project of the person who founded the company, René van Engelenburg. He graduated from the Rietveld Academy uh, by blowing up the Rietveld building, literally by making a very large installation out of it and putting it in a park. And you get kind of the interaction between something that's very fake uh, versus something that's very real. And uh, that was one of the first things um, that got us interested in thinking about how you can put art in a public space. Uh, and this was even way before new media as an art movement came about. This was, I think, when the only n new media art movement you had was video art, videotapes, cassette tapes. Um, this is like uh, uh, 2000. So we skip forward five years later and we go to the museum plan in Amsterdam. Um, and the museum plan in Amsterdam, I'm not sure how many of you have been there. Yeah, I'm pretty sure you're familiar with it. Uh, but uh, if you're not from around here, it's the, the square where all the museums are. Um, and this is at the time where uh, uh, new media art started to become uh, available in museums, but only if you paid entry money for it, right? So only if you had the funds or the education or you somehow you managed to get into the museum is when you were able to see new media art in the forms that were currently there. And we wanted to flip that around, not make new media art accessible to the people in the museum, but rather make it accessible to everybody that isn't in the museum. So instead of making it the museum plain, we made it plain museum by building a large hydraulic installation on top of the museum plain. And this thing unfolded. And when it did, it displayed the artworks that were shown in the museum that participated in it. So these had artworks from the Stedelijk Museum and from Centraal Museum in Utrecht and from all different kinds of museum in Holland. And that was the first new media uh, experiment in the public space that we did. Um, and we moved on to get a very, very large, we call it our XXL truck. This is a 60 square meter LED truck uh, with 250,000 LED bulbs, uh, which is, uh, it folds out. So the, the screen, it folds in and then you can fold it out and you get a, a very large screen. And we traveled with this unit throughout uh, all the capital cities of the provinces here in Holland and uh, invited people from colleges to submit their own artwork that we could showcase there. Uh, and the reason why we did this and how we eventually got to that project is that we were very curious to see what happens when you do a new media experiment in a public space. So what happens if you put a giant art installation and you say, watch out art, and you just place it in the middle of Almere and you just see what happens. Um, and we invited young designers to play around with that idea this is at the time, of course, when uh, you could start to create your own things. So everybody, it's that 2006, 2007, so the rising of YouTube, so everybody became a visual artist. 
and that leaves a very weird definition of wha- who is an artist and what does art actually do and if I what do I upload and what do I not upload and how do I even make a video it's a very experimental time and I mean eight years later it still is but at the same time it's been very commercialized so it's also a very steady model there's now theories on it and how you do that um, but we wanted to m- make that experiment happen and we wanted it to be public so um, we built a network of screens following that big screen. We um, placed several public LED screens uh, at places in Holland, at train stations, at Schiphol Airport, at Breda. This one is at uh, Neude at Utrecht. And we asked developers to make apps. I think this was before apps as well um, for this screen. So we had a this is a, a now that I'm looking back on Tinder. This is something that I think we should have copywritten this. We call this Demo Crazy and it was a mobile app um, and you went to a website and you got shown a picture of somebody who was very controversial in the world history and I mean that can be anybody. I mean it could be a dictator but it could also be Justin Bieber and when you were shown that picture you had to choose whether you liked that person or whether you didn't like that person. So swipe left or swipe right and the person who had the most polarizing opinions So the people who had the most varied opinions, like most people loved him and hated him, they were shown the biggest on the screen. And that changed over the course of time as the uh, festival, I think this was at at Impact Festival. So that changed as the Impact Festival went on for three weeks. Uh, You could see the pictures of people changing. So depending on if you thought Pamela Anderson was a hero or not, you would see her picture get bigger or not. And those contrary opinions, we wanted to see how the public would react on these new media experiences. Um, so we did this in Venice as well for the Biennale, four times to be exact. We did new media installations there showing Dutch young talent, giving them stage to, to showcase their work at. And we wanted to see what would happen. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been to the Biennale in Venice, but it's a very weird place if you are into art, because on the one hand, it's the single most richest and I mean rich in the expensive sort of way art experience that there is. It's very highbrow. And on the other hand, Venice is, of course, a very touristy city. So there's a lot of people there for the Biennale and a lot of people who have never been in touch with art for a large period of their lives. That kind of mixture of crowd, we wanted to reach them as well by placing the truck in the very public Arsenale Square in Venice and doing all sorts of experiments with it. So we put the demo crazy there as well. And we did a virtual bridge where you could play against somebody in Amsterdam. Um, And we had a video installation where you could text to the screen and it would spawn to that. And the reactions were mixed. On the one hand, many people were scared because it it is going to cost money. And it's always at a time, this was always at a time when a mobile data still costs a lot of money when you're in a foreign country or texting. You like you had only 50 texts a month. So sending a text to a screen is an investment. How does that even work? And is it worth it? But that always uh, succumbed to the curiosity of seeing what happens when you actually interact with the screen. So what happens when, you, uh, when you're triggered to do something with it, uh, then people want to try it and want to see what happens. And this kind of experiment, um, here you see it. We did it uh, as well with uh, uh, several uh, g- games. Um, Uh, We always asked game designers from uh, colleges that they were just graduating or had just graduated because we didn't want anything too established. Uh, We wanted the experiment to be experimental for the designers as well, right? Um, So we had funded the screen and um, uh, we started launching these games. We invited uh, the minister, Jet Bussemaker, to to join us. Um, And then I think this is all leading up from 2007 to 2012, 2011. And then you get the mobile data that's finally becoming more accessible to everybody and people get data bundles that they can actually use with their phone and it becomes much more um, accessible for everybody. So we made a big leap and we thought, okay, now that this is accessible throughout Europe, what else can we do with it? And we wanted to create a virtual bridge to keep that experiment going So we call it the Bridge Europe. And the Bridge Europe is that we basically split the big screen that we had into two little screens. And we placed one of them in a city in Europe. And we placed the other one in another location. And we connected them via internet. And we made games or applications that you could use 
uh, when you're in front of the screen. So then we get to the design process, because that's all the, uh, we wanted to do the experiment in public space, but how do you actually get games that work? How do you make sure that, that the things that are created are actually good, or actually work? Uh, this is a picture of the opening we did of the Bridge Europe in Sweden in 2014, um, when one of the screens was traveling between Amsterdam and The Hague, and the other one was in Stockholm for um, uh, three weeks, and then it, uh, it traveled up north to Sweden. I'm going to show you a little video impression of what that screen actually looks like in action. Here you see one of the dancers from the uh, Nederlands Dans Theater, and they wrote a choreography based on one of the applications that were written for the screen. I'm going to show you a little video of that. Should clarify it. And I think this um, project demonstrates a lot of uh, the things that we struggle with when we try to get these things going. Is that you ha we had an idea that we wanted to do a virtual bridge, but how is this virtual bridge actually going to look like? How is it actually going to function? And what kind of new media is it going to use? So for this one, we use the technology of the Kinect camera, um, but we used a much more powerful version of it. You can see it here. It's actually a um, agricultural motion tracking camera that is used in potato factories to detect any blemishes on the potatoes so it's a it's, it's resolution it's much sharper than the actual connect camera and its depth is much uh, deeper it's much more finely attuned so we could do more things with it um, and we asked game developers to make a short game and it had to do certain requirements when you do these things in a public space so for instance the game had to be completely self-explanatory so you had to be able to just be there not know there was going to be a truck, you had to walk in front of the truck and immediately be appealed and triggered by the game to play it. So you couldn't have lengthy instruction manuals or tutorials, you just had to be able to jump in front of it, play it and figure it out as you go along. And that also required a learning curve to be uh, relatively short, but allowing failure as an option when you play the game. So if you don't get it and it frustrates you, that's okay. Because that's, I think, part of the, the experiment when you when you start playing with these games, that, that if you don't get it right away, that's not bad. It's more about discovering how it works and getting attuned to that and then uh, figuring it out as you start to play. And there always had to be a connection with somebody on the other side where you had to, sometimes you could actually see who you were playing against and sometimes you would see them later on. But you saw one of the games, um, all of the games are very topical as well, so you saw one of the the games was based on a Swedish folklore tale where you played one of the dragons eating Viking boats and then somebody else played the other dragon and you could see whichever person uh, ate the most boats won. 
So we did this in Venice as well. We built the instant sculpture garden, also using the Kinect camera. And you would see uh, famous statues appear on the screen. You had to pose as those statues. And the one who did the pose the best, as tracked by the camera, would get a photograph taken and would be added to this virtual sculpture garden, basically. Um, um, and the other thing that we discovered is when you put on the webcam, that's the most fun. If you just let people wave to each other, you don't really need to do anything else. But we wanted to do something more with that, right? We wanted to be people to see each other, but also go, be triggered to go some, some a little bit deeper as well. So um, we're, for we're almost getting to <laughs> this project uh, where we are now, because this is like last year we um, started working together with Engage Media, and they do the uh, the broadcasting for all the uh, screens on uh, stations here in Holland. There's like 30 of these screens. And we're trying to get this technology that you just saw in that video into these screens as well, so that you can play these games at stations while you're waiting. And we currently have the first screen ready in Hilversum, Central. If you walk out there, um, there's a big interactive screen, and we're going to launch at the end of this year the first games made by HKU uh, students that uh, you can actually play on the screen. So we also do these kinds of projects in Lowlands. Sometimes we make them gamey. We use games a lot because I think uh, games are a great way to trigger people to explore. They, whenever you add gamification, you all know it. When you add gamification to something, it becomes much more easy to get involved into it as, as in the designing process, but as well in the user experience process. Um, but in Lowlands, we also do just a relatively old-school new media project. It's the, uh, the, the big photo booth. We take four historical art paintings, and we cut out the main characters of the paintings, and you get to pose as those characters. So you get to put on a nude costume, and you get to lay in front of the uh, uh, portraits. And when you lay in just the right spot, you look like you're actually inside the picture. Um, and this is also really based on that philosophy of um, um, making art and new media as accessible as possible to everybody and getting them as involved into it as they can. So we're going to do this this year again, except with different paintings. But you'll see in a second how you get involved. Once you get involved into it, you people start to lose their inhibition as well. Like they're much more free if they're if you invite them to wear a nude costume on stage. And of course, the actual photos that we took, uh, we uploaded to Facebook, and the photos that they, the people uh, that the, the were tagged in it, uh, were also their museum tickets, so they could see the actual artwork in the museum as well. Also, the um, uh, the time that we started using our hard we because we, as we said, we always work with LED screens because the reach is much bigger and the amount of uh, uh, people that you can reach is much bigger that way. Uh, so we made a hydraulic LED unit that actually lifts up and it creates a booth underneath. Um, and of course, you can see that if you just look over there, it's right there. But that's the actual one of the hydraulic trucks, and the other one is currently in Brussel. And tomorrow it will be in the European Parliament, and it will be connected here. And Prince Constantijn, who is a member of the Dutch royal family, will be here, and he will write on our big art ride. And that's actually the latest and also the uh, most grand of our projects, and so far also the most stressful, but also the most fun we've ever worked on. 
Um, we wanted to do something with VR. When we first saw the Oculus Rift, and we had, uh, I think, a, a, a demo version with us in the, uh, the Venice Biennale, I think that's two years ago, and we were playing around with it, and we really wanted to do something with it. But we didn't know what, like create a virtual maze, but that's fun, but it's like very single player experience. How can you reach, how can you make sure that everybody gets to experience it, and it's not just people looking on and thinking, oh, well, that's nice, okay, bye. How do you reach many people with it? So we, w we were puzzling with that. And then we, um, we read about uh, the Dutch presidency of the European Union for the next six months. Mm. So we thought, okay, maybe if we take something very Dutch and we take it and we, we start stripping it apart and we try to take it throughout Europe, how would that work? So what's something very Dutch? Well, cheese and windmills, but also uh, uh, cycling. So we thought, okay, maybe we can do something with cycling. And how do we make a European identity of that? So we made a game. And you can see a screenshot of it here. It's actually a virtual reality game uh, that is constructed out of uh, artworks submitted by all 28 European member states. They submitted their most famous building, as you ca if you can call it that, because uh, that's very subjective, of course, and two of their most iconic artworks. And the game generates a mashup of those uh, uh, buildings and artworks every time that you play it is randomized. Now, you can set the countries that you cycle through, so uh, when we are here and we are now in Brussels, we start off in the Netherlands and you cycle and you end up in Brussels. But we can change the, the cycle course as you go along with it. Um, but as you cycle along with it, um, something very strange happens. Um, how many of you have tried the big art ride here already? You have? Okay. You're the only one? There I think the rest of you should try it because it's a bit weird. Um, I've we noticed this when we were designing this, right? Um, I think, uh, how many of you here have had a Oculus Rift or a VR glass headset on, right? And how many of you have, have used it to watch a movie, had a, a, a cinema experience with it? Okay, I see a few. So a few have had it on, but this is, um, we tried, well, well we combined the uh, very passive aspect of the Oculus Rift, of having it on and just looking around, which is rather passive, and combining it with something that's very active and requires a different part of your brain, such as cycling, and when that happens, and I'm not sure if you'll agree, maybe you will, it becomes very disorienting. Was that the case for you as well? Yeah, okay, we'll talk about this when we get a hand up mic. I wanna hear your experiences. It's, uh, it's always the most fun. Because so we were trying it out, we, um, we built a virtual bike, you can see it um, here. Uh, the bike, actually, of course, is actually real. It's connected to a uh, uh, computer, and which is uh, connected to the LED screen, which is connected to the other screen, which is traveling throughout 10 European capitals. This is in Poland. Um, and you ride the bike against somebody on the other side, and we invite everybody, whoever is around, to join us. So you get a very wide age range, uh, and you get a very different crowd wherever you are. So sometimes we get the ambassador, and I think it's last week we were in Prague and there was a tattoo fair. So we got some of the people working there as well. Or we invite mascots to join us. Sometimes we invite school children to, to come play with us and join it. And it's different for everybody, but there are two things I think that are quite peculiar to it. Is the one thing is if you combine virtual reality um, experience with something very physical, you your brain disconnects for a second in what kind of impulses it's supposed to follow. So you're in a simulation and it's very obviously a simulation because the game, as you can see, it doesn't look hyper-realistic. It's more of a simulation. It looks more of a retro cycling game, uh, which we did on purpose because if you're on it, you sometimes forget that it's a simulation and you actually start to believe that when you're turning and you go up a hill that you're gonna fall off the bike knowing full well that you're actually on a very stable bike which is set in a frame. So there's no way that you can actually fall off, but it might feel differently when you're on there. So that sensory um, disconnection that you feel is something I think is very strange. And it goes away if you play the game multiple times. You get you eventually you get better at disconnecting it. Um, but now the simulation is a very clean one. So it's it's nice weather, the buildings are very peaceful, but if we put this in like a very, we add explosions or we add like a chase element to it, it becomes much more impressive um, or weirder perhaps. Um, 
And I don't think we would have ever discovered that had we not just tried it. It said like, okay, well, we're just going to design this and we're going to put it out to public space and have as many people as we can from as many different demographics as we can try it out as well. Because I think the most fun is when you get parents to play this game, is you get a mother who's like 40, 45 years old and if she has like a nine-year-old son and the nine-year-old son plays it and he's very smooth in the game. He just races through it. And then we always get like that she asks, oh, well, uh, can I play it? Yeah, of course you can. And then it's like, hobbling on the steering wheel and it's it's weird how how that works um and i mean there's no research if younger children are better in vr experiences versus older people i don't know if that's the case i'm assuming that there's got there is something to do some correlation between that but i'm just talking from my own experience in in that regard um but we're traveling with this uh so we're connecting brussels to the campus party tomorrow and then we're traveling to uh, Berlin, and we're going to end up in London, and then we're going to go to Bratislava. And at the end, in July, when Holland hands over the presidency to uh, the Czech Republic, we're eventually going to um, uh, uh, let go of this project as well, and we're going to see what else we're going to do with this. Um, but I just wanted to share with you a little bit about uh, these, how, how we get to create these kind of things, um, and what, especially about the vision, that's m basically where I come in and think about how is it going to work, what are we going to do with it. Um, and one of the next projects that we're going to work on, that's I think also the final thing, is um, we're going to digitalize Palais at Low, is where you we're going to add a virtual layer to uh, the chambers of Prince Klaus. Uh, so basically, if you're going to uh, uh, scroll around there with a tablet, you get to see part of the history of the royal family, something that might have been hidden if you look in the actual room itself. So I think that concludes it, and I think you should all play it, but uh, thank you. We, got, uh, we had one uh, person in the audience already did the bike ride. Who was that? Yeah, we, w we wanted to hear his experience, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll hand you over the mic. Let us know. Hi. Oh, it's really weird because when you move fast with your head, it feels uh, uh, like you're falling. Can you speak a little bit more in the microphone? I can't hear you. Uh, you have feeling like falling from the bike or something. You had the experience that you were going to yeah. fall from the bike, but mm -hmm. how was that? Because you knew you were on a fake bike, right? Yes. So uh, why could you not just say tell yourself that? I don't know. <laughs> it <laughs> it's really weird. Um, <laughs> what did you think before you started? Before you went on it and you looked at it? And you were up with them, there's usually people riding it. What did you think before when you were looking at it? Uh, I was curi curious uh, uh, how it is, but I don't know. <laughs> did you think it was going to be real or not? Mm, I, uh, I was... Um, no, <laughs> I don't know what I feel. Okay. <laughs> well, thanks for trying. I'm, okay. I'm definitely going to try. <laughs> I Good. have to. <laughs> Are there any more questions from the audience? Uh, one for me. Um, there's a, 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 a it's, a, it's like an input-output interaction. Like uh, one person does a little dance and someone else responds, or it's a virtual bridge. There's also a lot of uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence talks and and, and workshops, etc. Over here. Do you foresee? to add that to uh, to your screen, so that's actually like like almost the movie Her, that it's a smart thing that, that can have an interaction, a learning interaction with the audience. I think That would be really cool. That <laughs> I think that would be really cool, but I always think that we think from the human experience first and then see how that works, how that relates to new media technology. So we, we always start from the human point of view. So I think the user experience in this case is more important than the gaming experience or the machine experience if you know what i mean yeah no uh, that makes sense well tim thank you very much yeah you're welcome uh i think we have a challenge final here at five so if you are interested in that uh, stick around uh, the talks will start again at seven we have a war journalist on 360 video and after that uh at eight a set of speakers on drones so that's really interesting so for now thank you for your time and attention and uh, i'll see you later